here's something that really, really interests me. I can't wait to react to it with you guys. So, welcome folks, I'm Jabby Kuwait, joined by Amber Trujillo. We're looking at the science of extreme time dilation in Interstellar from Beyond Ideas, Beyond Ideas, the YouTube channel. Thank you, Beyond Ideas. If you guys enjoy the video we're about to watch, make sure to subscribe to Beyond Ideas. There's a link in the description below. You can click on that link and subscribe to them from there. Also give the original upvote. While you're subscribing and clicking on things, please subscribe here, bell icon, all notifications, and pretty please vote this up so that YouTube know you're enjoying what you're watching. Amber is super, super into astrophysics and all that cool stuff. So if you enjoy listening to a pretty gal talking about that, follow her on Instagram. Just so you guys know, I have an interstellar poster on my wall. Like, I love this movie so much. It's one of my favorites, I'm, too. I'm super into, like, this time dilation thing, so that's why I really want to watch this. This is the Miller's planet. It's the closest planet to the fictional black hole Gargantua. There's one scene that we're going to focus on today. So what's so special about this scene? Well, just in the span of this five second clip from this planet, Years have a passed. lot has happened on Earth. Mm, That's I crazy. That. A lot. The score does that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah the music ticks up faster. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's Hans Zimmer. For you, you might be wondering why. Well, just after the touchdown on the planet, Dr. Cooper said something very important. Oh, he can't show any of this because of uh, seven years per hour. Yeah, because so of the seven co years copyright per hour. claim. What he means by that is that if they spend one hour on that planet, time will pass seven years back on Earth. So how is that possible? In this video, we're going to explain time dilation while bringing the context of what happens in Interstellar. We touched upon the fundamentals of this topic from our previous video about Einstein's relativity. You can check out the video here, but just to give you a brief summary, we can say the following. Under the influence of a strong gravitational field, time slows down. So if you're just hanging out near a massive object, you will experience the effect of time going slower. But gravity isn't the only thing that can warp time. According to another one of Einstein's theories, special relativity, time slows down for an object when it moves. Combining these two concepts together, we could consider this scenario. Suppose that we walked up a flight of stairs. Our body is slowly moved away from Earth, meaning that we will experience time going faster. But at the same time, since we are not stationary while going up, we should experience time going slower. So being farther from the pull of gravity causes our clock to tick faster, but moving counteracts this effect. Of course, this is all oversimplified, and the devil's in the details. That all kind of went over my head. Can you explain that at all? I, I, I know that we've been watching space videos for like the last two hours, but like, I don't understand. So what he's saying, okay, so he's talking about time going slower due to your altitude, is that what he's saying? And then it having to do with, he, so he was talking about something, but Motion. going up the to the side. Because I know, okay, look, so. <laughs> Let's back up, we're one. Have you heard the twin paradox? No. Okay, so the twin paradox is if twins were born and one grew up on a beach and the other grew up on a mountaintop, one would be older than the other oh. by minuscule of a second. So yeah, yeah. that's what he's trying to explain here is that if, while you're going up the stairs, time is moving faster for you. But he was talking about going vertically. I don't know. I kind of missed that part. Kind of went. So the person on the mountain is older or younger? You age faster if you're up in space if you're if you're on top of the mountain now this is like within seconds less than seconds yeah, milliseconds well, milliseconds i understand the concept of like the atomic clocks like right. one was on the ground one was in a plane and it also has yeah it has to do with velocity as well how yeah. fast you're moving i mean speed of light is when time slows as well right right so it has to do with how close you are to gravity so when you are what your gravitational pull is yeah so if you're closer to the center of gra gravity which you are on, on a Earth. beach, on a, yeah. compared to on top of the mountain, your pull of gravity is going to be stronger. Now, what I don't understand what he was saying is, is he was, I'm sure he's correct, it just went over my head, was going up the stairs, but because you were going a certain way, it also slows down, so. Well, you're feeling, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 he said it was an oversimplification. I'm like, um, that was complicated as <laughs> Let's just yeah. watch that part again. Suppose that we walked up a flight of stairs our body is slowly moved away from Earth, right. meaning that we will experience time, time going fast. faster. Gotcha. But at the same time, since we are not stationary while going okay. up, we should experience time going slower. Why? So being farther from the pull of gravity causes oh. our clock so to you're moving faster, at a certain speed, but moving it goes counteracts slower. this effect. Oh, okay. Of course, this is all oversimplified. Oh, I see what he's saying. The devil's in the details. But gotcha. let's not forget why we're here, talking about time dilation. 
Hey, you, listening to you talk about the concept of the twins actually helped me to get this better because I thought about the atomic clocks thing and mm -hmm. all that. Okay, cool. I'm, I'm getting a little bit better. Gravitational redshift. Ooh. Let's consider two comparable cases. We have person A floating nearby a massive object with a lot of gravity, and person B just casually floating in an empty void of space. Person A shines a green laser beam towards person B. Because light is a form of vibration, mm -hmm. the laser beam has a color that corresponds to 600 trillion vibrations each second. Now, light is also a form of energy, and as that beam of light comes out of the gravity of the massive object, it loses a lot of energy. This loss means that there is a decrease in frequency. So by the time that beam of light reaches person B, its frequency will have decreased by some factor. That means instead of the green light at 600 trillion vibrations a second, person B gets only, let's say, 10 billion vibrations per second, mm. which is a microwave radio beam. Mm. This phenomenon is called gravitational redshift. Oh. But not so fast. Individual wiggles don't just go anywhere and disappear. Since person A creates 600 trillion wiggles every second, while person B only gets 10 billion every second, the only way this can happen is if one second on one astronaut's clock is not the same as one second on- oh, I'm a little bit distracted because the, the red wiggle thing looks kind of grody. It almost looks sexual to me. <laughs> it's because it's like, hey there, baby. Well, thank you. Now I'm not going to be able to pay attention either. Think about the wiggles. But not so fast. Individual wiggles don't just go anywhere and disappear. Since person A creates 600 trillion wiggles every second, while person B only gets 10 billion every second, the only way this can happen is if one second on one astronaut's clock is not the same as one second on the other astronaut. In other words, it only takes one second for person A to create those 600 trillion wiggles, but it will take 60,000 seconds or nearly a day for person B to receive them. Mm -hmm. So this is what happens. Our clocks run at a widely different rates, and by clocks, I don't mean just mechanical or electronic devices, but also biological clocks, like your heart, lungs, your brains, etc. Person A takes a breath, and takes another breath, and measures a few seconds between the two. For him, everything feels normal. Clocks stick the way they are supposed to. On the other hand, person B, watching person A through a telescope, sees everything in slow motion, with several days passing between the two breaths. So now revisiting this scene again from Interstellar, you should get a better understanding as to why Cooper says that he will be the same age as his daughter. That didn't actually help me to understand no. the time dilation. That actually made it harder. Technically speaking, I mean, assuming obviously gravity next to them is cha is what's changing things, right? Right. Because one of them is next to a freaking black hole and the other is not. That is the time dilation that I understand. Otherwise, if all things being equal, time is ticking the same on both sides. You're just reading it differently on the other side based on what he's saying there, right? If I'm, you know, astronaut A and you're astronaut B and I'm sending my wiggle at you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but if the gravity is the same on both sides, you're just looking at it differently. It just looks weird to you from where you're standing because of the redshift, right? But for me, it's normal. And for all intents and purposes, what you're breathing on your side is also normal. I don't know if I'm making any sense. My, I'm my so brain dumb when it comes is to now this stuff. in a just... black hole <laughs> because I just, this is totally, I, I don't understand the wiggle. Like I know what redshift is. Um, it has to do with the Doppler effect. Well, I, I, I get what he's saying with regards to I think I understand like getting what getting redshifted. Yeah, I, I I think I understand what he's talking about with regards to observation. One of the things he mentioned was being next to a, a huge object with a lot of gravitational force right. or whatever, mm -hmm. and that was I guess affecting the wiggles. Okay, now I think I'm getting it a little bit. I don't know for sure, but okay, so so <laughs> but like okay, so the wiggles are happening more intensely with with astronaut A, Jabby on one side, right? They're happening more intensely because I'm next to that huge object with a lot of gravitational force, whereas you're on Earth or near it. You're not experiencing that level of gravity. And so that's why when it gets to you, it becomes uh, an expanded wave. But I guess what's kind of throwing me is, irrespective of where you're at, astronaut A, whether you're next to a huge object uh, near a black hole, or whether you are not near a black hole at all, but next to another Earth-like planet, you're still gonna experience redshift where the wave slows down as it gets to uh, astronaut B. No matter what, that's what's gonna happen. And so no matter what, wouldn't astronaut B see astronaut A as happening in slow motion? I think that's where I'm confused. Does that make any sense, my question? Honestly, right now, nothing makes <laughs> sense to me. <laughs> Everything is just right now, just like they're just wiggles in my head right now. Okay. It was a very interesting way to- um, Explain redshift. Explain time dilation okay. in general. Okay. Um, 
<laughs> you should get a better understanding as to why Cooper says that he will be the same age as his daughter by the time he comes back from the mission. I mean, by the time I get back, we might even be the same age. You and me. What? But don't worry, we're not done yet. Stick around if you want to learn more about time dilation in the next part of the video. Yeah, I want to learn more because I like I'm a little bit lost. I do like his presentation though. Yeah, no, 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 he's really great. According to Einstein's special relativity, the greater the acceleration of an object, mm -hmm. the slower that it will move through time. Mm -hmm. On Earth, where time is slowed by only a few microseconds per day, gravity's pull is modest. See, that's where I got confused about the twin thing because your acceleration, right? So like, um, okay, let's say the twins were in a, in, in, with the atomic clocks. Okay, I didn't clarify the atomic clock thing. So there was this experiment done a long time ago where they had these huge, massive atomic clocks, right? One was on the ground and the other was put into a really, really fast plane. Mm -hmm. And the plane flew around, you know, like hardcore speeds and came back and they found out that the clocks were off by like milliseconds. Right. Okay, so those, that's the atomic uh, clock uh, uh, experiment. So my question is, which clock is older? The one that flew around or the one that was on Earth? Because you were saying that the the The, the twin... one that flies around moves slower. Because remember, the faster you go towards the to the speed of light, the slower time moves for you. Right, right, right. So if you're stagnant, it's moving... Faster. Faster. R right, and so you're aging faster. Whoever's on Earth is aging faster. In the twin experiment or the mm -hmm. twin theory, the person on the mountain and the mm -hmm. person on the uh, the person on the ground is moving faster than the person on the mountain. Is what you're saying? It's not moving faster. They're technically aging differently. That specific paradox has nothing to do with has, speed. Has nothing to do with speed. It has to do with gravity. Oh, okay. how close? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how close you are to the center of gravity? It has nothing to do. And I think that's what he was talking about earlier. I was getting confused with the stairs because he was talking about the movement uh -huh. was then counteracting with altitude, I guess, going yeah. up. So you were, it was then counteracting. And It's hilarious to me that these oversimplified concepts are freaking complicated still. <laughs> <laughs> I like I'm like what? And that's how I know that I don't understand it well enough because I can't explain it in a simple enough way. That's how you know that someone really understands a concept when they can explain it to you like you're five. Well, being able to absorb information and compute it is not the same mechanisms as right. articulating it. So right. that doesn't mean you don't get it. That no, 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 right, right, right. You right. know, you just you might just not be able to articulate it very right. well. I, I stand corrected. Yeah. You are completely right. According to Einstein's special relativity, the greater the acceleration of an object, the slower that it will move through time. On Earth, where time is slowed by only a few microseconds per day, gravity's pull is modest. On the surface of a neutron star, where time is slowed by a few hours per day, gravity's pull is enormous. And at the surface of a black hole, time is slowed to a halt. That's a real image of a black hole, by the way. And you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And even before, you, were probably, you might have been about to say this, but Interstellar, if I'm not wrong, Gargantua, the black hole that they showed in Interstellar, that was before they saw this. Okay. So they used models, Kip Thorne and whatever team that he worked with, used models to be able to replicate what they think a black hole would look like. And then when they actually found it, it's extremely similar. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah, cool. Yeah. So that's how good it was. The gravity is so humongous that nothing can escape, not even light. The concept of the slowing of time plays a major role in Interstellar. In the movie, Miller's planet is depicted to be present in the warp space, very close to a black hole, Gargantua. Because of this, the pull of gravity on Miller's planet is enormous. So, if we apply Einstein's relativity here, we would know that Miller's planet would experience time at a very slow rate. But here on Earth, the gravity is at a modest rate, and the gravitational force of the Sun is also a billion times weaker than Gargantua. So, people on Earth experience time faster than that of the three astronauts on Miller's planet. And of course, all of this information is brought to you from the book, The Science of Interstellar, oh, wow. written by go. the scientific consultant of the film. In real life, this process is happening everywhere in space. He wasn't just a scientific consultant. The Interstellar was actually his idea that he brought to Hollywood and wrote with Jonathan uh, uh, Nolan, as far as I understand. Like, was it Jonathan? No, it, jo it was Interstellar, both Nolan brothers? Yes. Oh. Yeah, as far as I understand, Kip Thorne had this idea like for a long time and he went to Jonathan Nolan with it. Or it, it got kicked around a lot and Jonathan Nolan eventually like wrote it for him. Mm -hmm. And then I think Spielberg was interested in making the movie and then eventually got to Christopher Nolan. Like Jonathan Nolan and Christopher Nolan working together on this was never the plan. Like that just happened. Like, Interesting. It's, it's bizarre to think about that because they're like brothers in Hollywood. There's a lot of people that could have. Christopher Nolan also changed the ending of the movie. I don't know if you know that. Like and it was supposed to be a dark that. ending. I'll tell you later. But yeah, it was supposed to be a dark ending. Oh, interesting. One interesting example is our International Space Station. 
Ocean. At the ISS, time runs slower as compared to time here on Earth. Technically speaking, it is in a different time reference than we are. So by calculating the difference through Einstein's equations, we could correct the time at the ISS. Hmm. Because we used a lot of references to the movie Interstellar here, we might as well just take one case study of how filmmakers do this time dilation feel in the movie. In the opening scene when Cooper and his team stepped on Miller's planet, an intense music with clock ticking elements That's starts. What about. Yeah. The tempo changes over the so course good. of the song. It that was a weird edit. Oh, he can't play this. Oh. Yeah, he can't play this because of copyright issues, so he had to take it out. Oh. So he replaced it with, I think he replaced it with YouTube music. That's why the edit sounded weird. Mm. The soundtrack starts playing when the crew That's Just as a side note, that's really annoying. What he's doing here is legitimately fair use of the song because he's explaining something about the concepts of the movie and, and all that stuff. Like, there's no reason for him to be dinged for that. I think that's bullshit that they that he got dinged for that. That kind of sucks, because especially because it's so intrinsic to the explanation it's, that he's providing. Yeah. The soundtrack starts playing when the crew lands on the Miller's planet, where time dilation takes effect because of the proximity to a singularity. For every 60 seconds of the track, there are 48 ticks of the secondhand sound. So each tick is interval of 1.25 seconds. According to the movie, one hour on Miller's planet equals about seven years on Earth. Let's do the math on this. There are 3,600 seconds in an hour, and there are 24 hours in a day. So to get seven years, we need to multiply seconds in a day, days in a year, and multiply by seven years. Roughly, we'll get about 221 million seconds in right. seven years. This gives us a conversion factor of about 61,400 seconds, which pass on Earth for every second spent on Miller's planet. Multiply this by the interval between each tick, and you'll get 77,000 Earth second, or about 21 hours. So each tick you hear is almost a whole day passing on oh, Earth. Oh, wow. And this yeah. is side by side of what happens on Miller's planet That's wild. versus Earth in real time. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. To bring it all the way back to that. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. I I think that's one of the coolest. Uh, I mean, I love Hans Zimmer, yeah. oh, but gotcha. it, it's just like all of this. Yeah, I just love the the uh, Earth days to the ticks. It's really cool <laughs> little piece of information. Yeah. <laughs> After grasping all of this piece of information, of course, we want to ask the question, is this extreme time dilation possible on such a planet? Could we even walk on the surface of it? At one point, we are told that the gravity on this planet is 130% of the Earth's gravity. We see the actors panting, a little bit under duress because of the extra gravity. But is this enough for this kind of time dilation? Well, actually not even close. If you've visited the surface of our sun, which is not a supermassive body, but still much more massive than Earth, you would gain about 66 seconds per year. To get to an extreme dilation, where one hour corresponds to seven years, you would need such a strong gravitational field, essentially the event horizon of a black hole. There is simply no planet that can have this kind of gravity, and if you try to land on the surface, it would be so strong that it would crush you. The weight of the astronauts would be several million tons, and that's even without doing the math. Yeah, I, I recognize that, and I thought that would be the answer before he before he said it. The science fiction aspect of all mm -hmm. this invites the possibility of like considering these larger concepts yeah. in a way that maybe you hadn't before, because it's ev evoking you know thoughts. Yeah, because Christopher Nolan really wanted this uh, scene, mm -hmm. and so I know that Kip, Kip Thorne kind of was like, okay, yeah, it's a possibility. So so he let him he yeah. let him run with it. Well, I mean, there's a degree of just fiction to the whole thing in right. order to make the story work. I think it's cool anyway, even though it, it totally doesn't follow science because it invites the possibility of, of thinking about these things that are out there that maybe yeah. you never thought about because we're so like doing this all day. Yeah. We're not really thinking about what's out there anymore because we everyone, ki more kids today want to be like YouTube stars and TikTok stars and stuff like that than astronauts yeah. and scientists. That's a problem. Yeah. And so that's why I really enjoy stuff like this because it, it hopefully inspires more exploration of these ideas amongst the youth. Christopher Nolan is one of the- uh, Pioneers. Pioneers and he, I mean, that's how I got into science. I started loving science because of the Twilight Zone oh, and the Outer Limits. Gotcha. And that's what kind of, and I didn't even know that I liked science until much later on. Okay. Until I was like, oh, I really like these science fiction elements. Let me delve a little bit more into it. And then I got into Carl Sagan. Oh, and wow. And that kind of just opened up this whole different um, aspect of 
poetry and science. And I was like, oh, okay. I may not be the best at math, but I can still love and appreciate and do science within the storytelling aspect. You're becoming a more and more of a spokesperson for that community. And we need spokespersons. We need spokespeople. Yeah. You don't have to be like a, a brilliant scientist mm -hmm. to be able to be a spokesperson for the community and like kind of simplify and crunch down these ideas for the general mass like me. Yeah. Because like I'm a very pedestrian fan of astrophysics and science and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't know anything about this stuff, but I'm a fan. But anyhow, if they wanted to get all the science right, we wouldn't be able to enjoy the movie. Exactly. Yeah. After all, it's science fiction. Mm -hmm. And to make a great film, a super filmmaker often pushes things to the extreme. Yeah. But in our case today, it's sufficient enough to turn the concept of time dilation into a beautiful film. Oh, I love this scene. We'll find a way, Professor, we always have. Thank you so much for watching this video. I'm Harry, and I'm so glad you made it to the end. The way that Jonathan Nolan originally wrote the ending was that Matthew McConaughey dies. Mm -hmm. He goes into the black hole and he dies, because that's naturally what would happen if yeah. you go into a black hole. You're just gonna get spaghettified and die. Or we don't know what would happen. Right. But, and so because of that, that's how the ending initially was. Mm -hmm. And Christopher Nolan's like, that's too dark. Yeah. <laughs> like, we need a hope. You know, we need to have a hopeful ending of some kind. And I think that Christopher Nolan's instincts here were on point. Yeah. They were so much better than what the original ending was. We didn't need mm. that. I'm glad that it ended the way that it did. There's still some weirdness in the film. Like, if you're super critical of it, there's still, there's still some odd things that I don't agree with, but there's still so much in the film that is so mesmerizing and powerful mm. that it's one of my favorite movies of all time. It's so. just a beautiful story that was able to pull really complicated ideas in science that were relatively correct for most of it. Yeah. Kip Thorne was like, is obviously amazing at this. They kept true to theoretical physics in what we know right now. And I thought that that was it's extremely hard to do to make that kind of stuff into an interesting story to watch. So. Yeah. Well, just to get, let you guys know, when I went to watch Interstellar, I wanted to watch it in IMAX because I knew it was shot with a lot of IMAX uh, scenes. Like it was proper IMAX, right? And the only showing available at the time because tickets were sold out everywhere was at 3 a.m. That was the earliest show I could go to. Wow. I went at 3 a.m. <laughs> I only got three hours of sleep and the movie is three hours long. I was hooked the entire time. Mm. With three hours of sleep at 3 a.m., I was hooked for all three hours of the movie. That's how strong it was to me. And that's like, yeah. that to me told me that, that's how you knew it was a freaking good movie because yeah. it kept me hooked the entire time. That's not everyone's experience. I'm super into astronomy, like pedestrian. I'm super into astronomy. So that's probably what helped, you know, at yeah. that hour because most people might fall asleep. I loved it. I thought it was great. Yeah. So this is a cool video. I thought that um, Beyond Ideas is, I'm surprised they only have 82,000 subscribers, um, but I thought he did a really good job with these concepts and boiling it down. I mean, I had to kind of go over it a few times. It's not entirely his fault because we've been watching science stuff for the past two and a half hours. Right. But. And this stuff is really dense too. Like even when I read about this, I have to read one paragraph 15 times to be like, what did, wait, what? Yeah. So so the fact that he was able to just like zoom through this yeah. was, uh, he did a pretty, he did a really great job. You guys, thanks so much for hanging out with us. Hopefully you enjoyed that. Do subscribe if you haven't already. Hit that bell icon, all notifications. And pretty please vote this up to let YouTube know you enjoyed what you watched. I'm Jabby Koi. This is Amber. Peace out.